Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Anthony Sardin. This is my first NACIS conference. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, seeing some of the presentations. And of course, it's wonderful to be able to do this remotely. Um, I'm based out of Mexico City. So uh, if you hear any sirens in the background or anything, don't be alarmed. That's entirely normal. Um, on that note, the uh, title of my talk is uh, Navigating Risk, the Challenges and Awards of Working with uh, Crime Data. For those of you that attended the keynote um, speech by Marusha Musakio, I work with Marusha for a company called Tierra that focuses on mapping crime data in Mexico. And so Marusha has, of course, already touched upon this in her presentation, but it bears repeating to understand the sort of the gravity of the situation in Latin America and specifically um, Mexico. Mexico accounts for 1.6% of the global population, but 6% of global homicides. Uh, a survey from 2014 found that 25% of Mexicans had been a victim of crime in the past 12 months, that 50% felt unsafe in their own neighborhood, and that meanwhile, 33% felt security was the number one issue facing the country. So there's a dire need for solutions to the crime problem in Mexico, yet often decisions around navigating um, crime risk, whether you're in a government, a company, or an individual, are generally based on incomplete information and a poor understanding and interpretation of crime data. And when we're talking about crime, there's really no room for mistakes. Um, making the right decision matters um, because it can be the difference between life and death. Um, last year, Forbes put out this article titled, um, These are the most dangerous neighborhoods in Mexico City. And you know, from the title, you might think that this is BuzzFeed, but no, it's, it's Forbes. Um, and I won't go into too much detail, but basically Forbes published this list of the 10 most dangerous neighborhoods. Um, and they did this by looking at the number of police investigations into high impact crimes during the month of June. Uh, and they sort of like ranked that list uh, looking and they saw that for example, that Centrocho has 44 investigations, Takua has 40, Juarez has 25. And if I'm drawing your attention to this article, it's because incredibly this single sentence essentially summarizes everything that's wrong with how crime data is often interpreted. Um, it's almost every single mistake I've seen in 13 words, which is pretty incredible. And you know, reading the sentence, I'm sure that some of these issues are probably jumping out at you. Uh, however, some may be less obvious. So let's, let's start with the obvious, um, Forbes, estimated the risk of a neighborhood by looking at the number of police investigations um, in each area. The mistake is obviously that they didn't control for population. It's no surprise that the most dangerous neighborhoods according to the list are the most populous ones. Places with higher populations um, have more crime for the same reason that they have more cars and seafood restaurants. It's, it's not, but it's not just resident population that matters. Uh, places such as markets, uh, university campuses have few residents, but they have high foot traffic and therefore um, they also have more crime incidents. Thus to get a true appreciation of how dangerous a place is, you need to normalize crime, inc crime incidents by this total population, uh, which is essentially you know, the both resident population and the floating population. Um, otherwise you're just getting a map of, of human density. Um, second, the article focused on police investigations. Now, Mexico, like most countries, has a relatively complex crime reporting pipeline. Depending on if, how, and where you report a crime, the incident could end up in one, several, or no databases. And to base one's decision making on a single database is to essentially integrate that database's biases into your decision making. So as an illustration, here are the number of assaults per 100,000 people for two municipalities in the state of Baja California. The top plot shows the assault rates according to police investigations, which is the same source that Forbes used. The bottom plot shows the assault rates according to the database of 911 calls. Now, if you were to base your decision making on the top plot, you would assume that Tijuana and Ensenada have comparable assault rates. And you'd be missing the fact that based on 911 calls, Tijuana appears much more dangerous than Ensenada, uh, almost twice as much so. Now, 
keep in mind that due to the nature of the reporting pipeline and the reporting population, every source has its bias. In fact, some sources are more reliable for certain crime types, certain demographics, or certain areas than others. But the point is that to base one's decisions on a single source can potentially lead one to incorrect conclusions. So the correct approach is to consider as many sources as possible and to correct for the biases where you can. Third, Forbes based its conclusions on the number of high impact crimes in each neighborhood. Now there's a, a common misconception uh, around crime and that is that crime is a monolith. The, the place with the highest homicide rate is also the most dangerous in terms of assault, robbery, kidnapping, burglary, you name it. In reality, this is far from the case. Um, so this is a plot that shows the rates of car robberies and of homicides uh, for every municipality uh, in Mexico. So um, uh, as you can see, there's just little correlation between the two. Now, why does this matter in this case? Because for the Forbes article, the category of high impact crimes, which they looked at, which is an official category used by Mexico City, does not include kidnapping. And kidnapping is presumably something that you're interested in knowing about when you want to avoid the 10 most dangerous areas in Mexico City. So this is why when assessing crime risk, it's important to consider all crime types that are relevant to the type of risk you're trying to manage. Otherwise, you're inviting blind spots into your analysis. Finally, sampling. And this one is a little more convoluted, but the basic premise is intuitive. This timeline shows the monthly number of homicides in downtown Mexico City. Now, as you can see, the value fluctuate, fluctuates around the dotted line. The dotted line is the mean, um, and it sits at a little over two. Um, the purple vertical stripe shows the homicide count in June 2019, which is the value used um, by Forbes. Um, and you know it's, it's half of the true mean rate. Now, had they done the same analysis two months prior um, in April, they would have found a homicide rate, which is five times higher. So what I'm talking about here is familiar to anyone who's taken an introductory stats class, um, which is sampling. So the this plot shows robberies in downtown Mexico. Specifically, it shows weekly values on the top, bi-weekly in the middle, and monthly values on the bottom. And what we can see is that the weekly values fluctuate around uh, some mean. But as we look at the bi-weekly and then the monthly plots, we see that the variation from one point to the next decreases. This is because as our level of aggregation, our time window gets bigger, we average out the random variation and we get to the true underlying mean rate, the true crime risk, if you want, of, of those areas. Now, if you take too small a time window, you're basically including too much random variation into your estimate of crime risk. So the question is obviously, well, what is the right time window? And the answer is that it depends. It depends because as you can see here, the plot on the left shows weekly, monthly, and tri-monthly, that is three months, um, robberies and downtown Mexico City. The plot on the right is the exact same, but instead of robberies, we're showing homicides. Looking at the plot on the left, you can see that um, variation in robberies stabilizes somewhat um, when aggregating by month and almost completely when aggregating over three months. Meanwhile, for homicides, the plot on the right, um, even the three month time window, the one all the way at the bottom, you still get considerable variation. And the reason is simply that the more uncommon the crime type, the larger your time window needs to be. So a one month aggregation may be sufficient for robberies, but you would need to look at three to six months probably for homicides. And recall that the Forbes article looked at a single month for its high impact crimes, the month of June. High impact crimes includes homicides. Well, what we can see here is that looking at a month of data, 
is insufficient to estimate the true underlying rate. In fact, even three months may be too little. But crime type isn't the only factor that matters. The plot on the right is the same as before. That is weekly, monthly, and tri-monthly uh, homicides in downtown Mexico City. The plot on the left is also homicides, but for the whole of Mexico City, the whole state. So basically a much bigger area. Note that for downtown Mexico City, the plot on the right, um, you still get variation at the three month aggregation level. Whereas for the whole of Mexico City, the plot on the left, you actually get a stable-ish value for monthly values. And especially for, for tri-monthly, you're getting essentially like a much flatter line. And this is because not only does crime type matter, but the size of the location that you're looking at matters too. The smaller the area you're looking at, the larger your time window needs to be to get a read of the true crime risk. So to summarize, when considering crime data to evaluate whether an area is dangerous or not, you need to do one, normalize the data appropriately, in this case, by taking into account the total population. Two, factor in source biases, uh, ideally by considering multiple different sources. Three, consider the range of crime types that are relevant to the risk assessment you're trying to run. And four, use the appropriate sampling based on the crime type and the area you're looking at. Now, you know, this is a pretty involved and complex undertaking and that's why Tierra is trying to make that somewhat easier with something that we built that we call the risk score. Basically, Tierra takes in crime data. It makes all the necessary corrections. It takes into account all the factors I mentioned earlier and it outputs a number between zero and 10. It's a simple interpretable number that allows individuals to understand crime risk without running the risk of making incorrect inferences. And we put that on a platform. Um, so you can easily see which areas are riskier than others, whether it's because you're interested in you know, buying a new house or opening a new shop or just walking uh, home at night safely. And you know, with my remaining time, I'd like to give another, a couple other examples of, of how this can be used. Um, so one client of ours, for instance, was interested in assessing um, or figuring out how predictable the number of ATMs that it managed were being robbed. Uh, so what we found is that the higher the risk score of an area, the greater the proportion of ATMs in that area were being robbed. So as you can see, that, that, that's that increasing line up there that as the risk score goes up, so does the proportion of robbed ATMs. But you'll notice that it sort of caps off at a point and then actually goes down. And that's because we found that the most dangerous areas, um, banks were taking additional precautions to minimize the likelihood of robbery because they knew that these were dangerous areas. Uh, so for instance, by keeping ATMs within bank branches themselves. As another example, we found that the higher the risk score of an area, the lower the average value of property there. So on average, we found an increase of one risk score point was associated with a decrease in property value of 200 US dollars per square meter. And finally, and I'm just including this because unfortunately this is still topical, but back in April, um, when Mexico was just starting to shut down due to coronavirus, we saw an explosion of news stories going on about how quarantine was causing a surge in robberies and looting because stores were being left unattended, et cetera. So we went kind of against the grain here and we built a model that related crime levels to human traffic flow, which of course dropped during lockdown. And thanks to this model, we predicted a drop of 65% in crime rates, which ended up being correct. But more relevant to the problem at hand, we showed how the neighborhoods that were experiencing looting during those first weeks of quarantine were simply high risk locations. So not only was the overall magnitude of looting lower, the distribution of locations which were experiencing looting was no different than what we would expect under normal, uh, under normal conditions. So using reliable data and analysis, we were essentially able to debunk a false media narrative, uh, which could have been the basis for some bad decision making. And I think I'm running a little tight on time, so I'll, I'll just finish things here. I do want to close by saying that 
that although the problem of crime and violence in Mexico is serious, and there are still obviously ways to go, I do believe that we can make a dent in this. Um, and before you can take appropriate action, you, you need to proper understanding of the problem at hand. And I do think that Tiara is helping provide just that. And the best part of all this is that even the smallest dent is a remarkable achievement because there's nothing insignificant about saving even a single human life. And um, I think that that makes it all worth it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. Uh, you'll have to look, I don't know if you have Slack up, you'll have to look and see uh, additional comments come in. Um, the first question that came in is about uh, the Forbes piece that you began with. And so Katie Kowalski noted, I've noticed many articles like this Forbes piece, and I'm wondering what ways Tierra engages with journalists to show the intricacies of these stats and how easy it is to create, you know, kind of a, a misinforming uh, graphic statistics, et cetera. At this stage, um, not so much, although we do have a newsletter that we um, put out on a sort of a monthly basis that we help hope helps inform um, basically how to understand stats and sort of you know guides uh, people who are maybe writing about crime for the first time to uh, you know take into account the right considerations. Um, and you know I gave an example at the end there where we uh, had an op-ed of uh, the Financial Times uh, where um, you know we sort of linked Tiara and we showed how um, that this is a source that they could use um, for a sort of a better crime reporting. Um, but I think that's something that we're going to definitely be tackling more, um, you know, in the months and years to come. Great, thank you. Um, another question that just came through was. Um, is the risk score kind of the operations, the math, the algorithm behind that? Is that kind of open access? Um, at the moment, it isn't, um, uh, just because uh, it's something that, uh, I mean, it, it's a sort of a, a TR product that we sort of um, built and uh, that we do need to uh, monetize in some ways. So um, that's, that's how we make this all possible, that essentially if we are going to help people make informed decisions uh, about you know, um, which places are more dangerous. Uh, it does involve selling uh, this stuff to companies, to, to, to governments and the rest. Um, um, and also a lot of the data that we sort of uh, work with is proprietary. Uh, we have to sign NDAs with all of our crime data, which means that we're sort of restricted into what we make, can make available, just Thank from a you. legal standpoint. Uh, and then there was a request, uh for to be able to see some of the maps. From my understanding, you need like a login on your website for that. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, I mean, uh, I can definitely post a couple like screenshots uh, and I'll see with my uh, team if there's some way that we can maybe get some sort of access. I, I'm, I don't wanna to speak too soon though. Uh, I'll have to double <laughs> That's check fair. that. Yeah. That's fair. And this is um, somewhat related that came up for me. I'm curious about, you mentioned kind of the uncertainty with the individual sources you're bringing in. Um, I'm curious also just about like the biases and the uncertainties that come with just kind of stitching these together within your own team yeah. and like individual yeah. bias, organizational bias, stakeholder bias. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that as well. Sure, um, more about the source bias or the the, the internal biases that we... Um, so I'm interested in kind of the latter, but you can, uh, if there's sure. you have about two minutes, so maybe start with the last. Okay, great. You can always see the first two. Okay, in terms of uh, internal biases, I mean, so what we try to do is that we we um, our starting point is that there is no reason to assume that one source is going to be across the board better than an another, um, especially because we're still in the process of compiling a lot of this data. So we're really trying to be as uh, egalitarian in our in our treatment of this. And essentially, when we are Calculating the uh, the risk score for a certain area, and we're taking to a, trying to establish, you know, is this place more dangerous than another? Um, our algorithm sort of treats every source quite separately, and then looks if there is a consensus between all of them. Um, and so that is, uh, uh, you know, at this point, 
the way that we found to be the most fair until we sort of have a proper understanding of the sort of the nuances, how that varies, you know, over time across states, et cetera. We can't make the sort of fine tuning that, um, that would, necessary, would be necessary and I think would also be dangerous um, without, you know, really appreciating the, the, the specific biases of each one. That so our approach right now has been very egalitarian. We don't treat any, any source as more important than another. Great. We are running out of time, but there's a related mm -hmm. question from Denise Liu in the chat. Um, I suggest okay, following sure. up too, um, and it's related to uncertainties in geographies. And so um, okay, I mean, similar related to that. But thank you so much for your Great. presentation, for no, sharing with no, us your work. And, no worries. Uh, and if, if there are any other questions, I'll do my best to answer as many in Slack. So thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Anthony. All right.